serve a great God, don't we? Amen. We serve a great, great God. As I said, God is still in control of everything. Everything in our lives, God is in control of. Uh, it's just a proven fact by the Word of God. We tend to think sometimes that when things go haywire, that God's lost control, but He is in control. And if we trust and depend on Him, just like Sister Kathy said, the anchor will hold. All depends on what you put your anchor in. You know I like to fish. I didn't get to do much this year, but uh, I, like, I like to go fishing. And I take my, I have a small boat. Take it out, go fishing. Sometimes you find a spot, you don't want to move. You throw out your anchor. But if it's not grounded in something on the bottom, it just, you still drift along. We've got to make sure we're grounded. Grounded in the Word of God. Make sure our anchor is wrapped firmly around the throne of God. And we'll be okay, amen? We'll be okay. Uh, I have several announcements that I'm going to make at the end of the service once we're uh, no longer broadcasting. Uh, but I do want to make one while we are broadcasting. And that is about Brother Lewis. As you know, Brother Lewis went home to be with the Lord this week. And uh, many people have come and asked me about the service. Uh, we will be having a service here uh, Friday. Friday morning at 11 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. So Friday morning at 11 o'clock, we'll have service with Brother Lewis. He was cremated. Uh, his family will be back in town, and we'll do that service here in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock. So I want to do that so those that are watching online uh, would know also. All right, I have several other things, but we're going to talk about some things at the, at the end of this service uh, after the fact. Uh, last week, you know, I started out with one message Sunday morning, changed it to another message, left it, and went to a third message. This week, I'm going to revert back to the first message that I planned on preaching on the first Sunday in the new year, uh, dealing with our church. And I did bring my mic, Scott. I just didn't turn it on. There we go. And uh, so I want to talk about that just for a, a little bit, about moving into the new year. Uh, we, we're standing on the preface of a brand new year. As I said last week, I believe it was, you know, everybody gets excited. Boy, I'm glad 2021 was gone. Here we are in 2022. What I found out was I went to bed on Friday night with problems from 2021. And when I got up that Saturday morning, they were still there. 2022 did magically erase every problem in my life. Uh, and, and, but as I said and what I preached on last week, there's a lot of things we can change. There's a lot of things we can't change. What we can change is our outlook and our attitude. And we need to go into this new year with a better outlook, a better attitude towards the things of God, towards the situation in the world. It is very easy to sit back and complain about our government, our country, our president, our Congress, and, and probably justified complaining. However, doesn't do us any good. We might as well look on the bright side. And the bright side is simply this. With all the faults and failures, you and I live in the best country on the face of the earth. We have the most liberties and freedoms right now of any country in the world, and we need to realize that and be thankful for what we have instead of complaining and grumbling about what we don't. Now, I said all that because I was preaching to myself, not you. But if you got something out of it, great. I sound like I'm in a barrel down here. Can we do anything about that? Uh, Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Whatever you did helped. Philippians chapter number 3. Uh, I want to look at these verses as you're turning there. Uh, this is Paul's letter uh, to the church of Philippi. This was the first church that he established in Europe. He established it in his second missionary journey. Uh, this church meant a lot to the great apostle Paul. He is writing this short letter to the uh, people of Philippi uh, from a Roman prison. And so Paul is writing this letter to encourage them. The book of Philippi is a tremendous book. Paul begins and he talks about how we should have unity. And boy, that's something we need now, isn't it? In our country, in our families, in our churches, we need to come together in unity. I'm going to tell you something. We're not always going to agree, right? 
We're not going to agree with one another all the time. You're not going to agree with your spouse all the time. You're not going to agree with the family down the pew all the time. But that doesn't mean that we have to be at one another's throats. We can still live in harmony and unity even though we might disagree on some things. So Paul begins this book by talking about unity. He then goes on to talk about our freedom from legalization. Our freedom from the law. He's talking about grace, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. He goes on in this book to talk about salvation and then stewardship after that. It is a tremendous, tremendous book. Here in chapter number 3, what we're going to find is Paul taking a spiritual inventory of his life. That's what I want you to do today. That's what I've been trying to do for myself. Take a spiritual inventory of our lives. So here we got the great Apostle Paul, which I think uh, in the New Testament, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest man to walk across the pages in the New Testament. Out, not counting the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse, let's start, and I'm not going to read all the verses, and I'll get down here in a moment, we'll stop and have prayer when we get down to where we're going to preach. But in verse number 4 through verse number 6, Paul gives us a list of his credentials. I'm going to read those to you, and I want you to think about these credentials. This is Paul describing himself. He said, Though I might have, uh, also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath uh, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. What Paul is saying, if we're going to trust in our works, there's not a man walking that could trust in more works than what Paul could. He gives his credentials. Listen here in verse number 5. Circumcised the eighth day. That tells you and I that he come from a family that was very well uh, rooted in, the, in Judaism and, and, and the law in so much that they held to that law so tight that they had him circumcised the eighth day. So he was raised in that kind of home. He goes on to say, of the stock of Israel, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's describing himself. For those that knew that Paul was from Tarsus and might uh, want to stand back and look at him and say, are you truly an Israelite? Are you truly a Hebrew? Uh, Paul clears that up right there. He said, I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews. That means he adhered to the law of the Hebrews as well as anybody could. A Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. And so Paul gives this a description of his credentials. And what Paul is saying is if any man could claim the law, if any man could say rather that his works could get him through, if that his works could get him uh, uh, to heaven, then Paul said, I'm the man. Nobody's got greater credentials than I do. No man has kept the law any better than I have. Uh, no man has a better pedigree in his background than I do. And so if you're going to say that your works and, and who you are is going to get you to heaven, then I'm front of the line. That's what Paul's saying. But then let me look on. But then Paul says here in verses 7 through 12, he tells us that all this pedigree, all this uh, uh, credentials that we just listed, that he counts them as nothing but dung, which, which simply means garbage or filth. So he says, as, as with my great credentials and with the way I've lived my life to the, uh, to the law of the Jews, it's just garbage. It's just garbage. What does he say? Uh, verse 5. So, or six, rather, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And he goes on to continue along those same lines. Paul is saying all those things when I was a younger man that I counted as, as so much value to my life. 
all the things that I thought was right and doing to keep the law, to serve God, uh, to make sure that I was heaven bound. All those things I realize now are garbage, are filth, are worthless. I realize now that if I'm banking on those things, that Paul would say, I'm of all men most miserable. But he's saying that he counted everything lost on his end to gain Christ. I want to talk this morning, and I want us to look at verses uh, 13 and 14 is where I want to spend my time. But I want to read verse 12 before I get there. This is Paul speaking, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul knew that he was not to the place he needed to be. All that the great apostle Paul had done, he realized that all he had done was not enough. Let's look at verse 13 and 14. I want to read those and then we're going to have prayer. The Bible says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we take just a moment, bow in your presence. We ask you, Lord God, to speak to our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Lord, you've already spoken to mine through the wonderful songs that we're saying here this morning. How, Lord God, they laid a, uh, laid a good foundation for this message. I am so thankful that you're in control. I am so thankful that the anchor holds. I'm so thankful, Lord God, that the word that you give us is concrete. It's not moving. It's not changing. The rules don't change in the, in the middle, Lord God, but you have clearly and purposely laid out in your word that we could understand how, what, or rather what we need to do to be saved. And then after that, how we should live on this earth. Father, I pray today that you would show us these three things that I'm going to speak of. And I pray, Lord God, that we would realize that we cannot count on our good works to do anything. But we must trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ if heaven is going to be our home. I thank you for those that are here today, Lord. I thank you for our visitors. And I pray that you'd richly bless every home that is represented here. Speak to us again, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I want to give you, going into the new year, this is what I intended to pre uh, preach last week. didn't work out. I want us to go into this new year. We're still at the very beginning of the new year. We've just got our toes in. We've not even got, really uh, got into the new year yet. Many people hadn't even gone back to work yet. But many are going back to work tomorrow. Don't grieve. Be thankful you got a job. Amen? So here I want us to look three different ways at once. I want us to look behind us. I want us to look where we're at. And I want us to look what's in front of us. And I believe we enter the new year and we look at those things. And I'm going to try to bring this to you from the Word of God. I believe it will help us as individuals. It will help us as a church to have a better year this year than last year. Now with that said, I guess I should uh, explain what I mean by better year. I don't necessarily mean that you're going to be more wealthy at the end of 2022. I don't necessarily mean that you're going to be healthier at the end of 2022. I don't mean that sickness might not come your way. I don't mean that trouble's not going to come your way. But what I mean is we need to work on our spiritual life. And, and if we'll do these things, then we as individuals and corporately as a church can do more for the cause of Christ in the upcoming year than we did last year. And we need to. That should be our goal. Think about what the Apostle Paul did. And yet he said, I've not yet apprehended. He said, I'm not what I need to be yet. I've not done everything I should have done yet. And we've not done a percentage of what he did. So we definitely need to keep pushing forward. So I'm talking about a, a spiritual inventory here. Again, Paul tells us that he has uh, not already attained in verse number 12, which simply means that, that he was unsatisfied with where he was at. 
I'm sure if I took a poll in our church right here, I doubt very seriously there's one person would, would raise their hand or one person would fill out the paperwork that said yes. If I ask a simple question, are you where you would like to be when it comes to your relationship with God? Are you doing everything for God that you feel like you should and what you would like to do for God? I don't think there's anyone here that would say, Preacher, I'm all that and then some. Amen? Including me. I don't think there's anyone here that feels like we can't do better in the future than we've done in the past. In fact, if there is anyone that feels that way, that is a scary place to be. Because now that means that you have plateaued and that means that you have become stagnant and that you're just going to sit there because you feel like you've done all you should do. And none of us are there whatsoever. So we need to keep pushing forward. When we get satisfied with where we're at, you know what comes next? Complacency. When we get complacent, we stop growing as believers. So we cannot get satisfied, we cannot get stagnant, we cannot get complacent in what we're doing. Well, preacher, we got, we're doing this. Well, that's great, but we should do more. But preacher, if we do what you're saying, and then we do this, and we do, keep adding, and we do this, you're just going to say we need to do more. You're absolutely right. Because we're never going to do too much. We're never going to do enough. We need to work and work and work for the cause of Christ in our lives and here at the church. Amen? Amen. Stay with me. I'm just, I ain't even got to point one yet, so stay with me. So here we are, West Corinth Baptist Church. What is today's date? The 9th? Is that right? January 9th, 2022. We don't write many checks anymore. We'd be messing that up, wouldn't we? We just don't do that much anymore. We depend on our phones and our computers, and, and they change that date automatically. But here we are right at the beginning of 2022. So we're going to make some decisions at the beginning of this year. Many of you made New Year's Eve uh, resolutions, which is no different than a vow. You've made a resolution. Some of you probably said, I need to lose weight. Most of us could probably say that. I know I could. And we say, I'm going to change and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to, I'm going to eat better. And if you're like me, I made it all the way to somewhere between January 2nd and January 3rd before I reverted back to my old habits. Well, when it comes to our spiritual things, we just simply cannot afford to do that. Because if I choose to go home today and Karen make a, and, and serve me a, a salad or make a nice meal that's, that's healthy, and I eat that meal, and then when I get up and I get hungry a few minutes later, and I go get a big piece of cake, which this church is what's made me fat, by the way. <laughs> I want you to understand that. Ginger has sent me all kind of sweets that I've ate. Uh, Cara, yeah, she's grinning back there. She made me a whole, Kathy Webb, she made me an entire uh, monkey bread thing. I'd never heard of that until we had a meeting back there a few months ago. She made me the whole thing. Well, for me and Karen. Karen never got to taste it. I ate the whole thing. So I'm blaming you for the condition I'm in. So let me get back here. So, but what I'm saying is, I make those choices. They affect me. When we choose to spiritually not do the things that we should do as a church, as individuals, when we choose not to witness, we choose not to uh, look for young people, not to take care of the elderly people, it's no longer about me, it's no longer about you. Our actions are having a direct effect on those around us. And it can have an eternal effect on those around us. If we don't tell them about Jesus, who's going to? And their eternity lies in the balance, church. We need to make sure that we're doing all we can for God. Well, preacher, you're wanting us to start the bus ministry, not just me, me and several others. And I want to get, yeah, but we get that going. You're going to want us to start a, a Spanish-speaking church. I think that'd be great. And we get that going. Yeah, but then you'd want us to do this. You're right. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be doing it. 
But it's going to take dedication from the people of this church to do so. Three ways we need to look. Because we are so blessed as a church. Three ways. We need to look at the past. We need to look at the present. We need to look at the future. I want us to take a look at these verses. See what I'm talking about. First, let's take a look at the past. Verse number 13. The first part of that verse. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. Now when I say look at the past, what does that mean? What does the word look mean? It means that we review what has already happened in the past. It means that we think back, what did I do this year? What did the church do this year? We began to take an inventory of what we did, good and bad, in the last year. Right? Tip, we don't go back much further than that because we took care of all that. January 1st, 2021. But many times we revert to the same things. So as an individual, let me start with that. You as a single person, the first thing you need to look back and make sure that when you're looking back in your past, you can find a place and a time that you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't find that place and time, and I'm not talking about the date and the time, I'm just saying you need to have a, a recollection uh, that you've been saved by the grace of God. You need to come to a place in your life that you repented of your sins, ask Christ to come into your life and save you. If you've not been saved by the grace of God, uh, then that should be the number one priority on your list going into 2022. And I would beg you, I would plead with you, I would encourage you to come to me and let me take the Word of God and tell you what it says about salvation. It's not a game, church. It's not come to church and fool mom and dad because I act good in church. It's not come to church and fool my spouse or fool this one or the preacher or anyone else. It is a serious thing. We're talking about an eternal decision. So first of all, you should be able to look back and see that you've been saved by the grace of God. And if you're like me, when you look back in your past, you're going to find uh, many failures. You're going to find many problems. And, and there's some accomplishments and there's some good things. But, you're, but it seems like it's the failures that really stick out. It's the failures that tend to halt you and I. We look back and we've got, uh, we've got plans that we meant to do and we didn't do it. And we did things we wish we hadn't have done. We said things we wish we hadn't have said. We severed relationships that maybe we shouldn't have. And we've kept relationships that we should have severed. We can look back in our past and find all these things. You and I. We're all, we're all the same when it comes to that. But here's the thing about looking back in your past. It can be hurtful. It can be painful. And I was going to say this. I've got it marked say later in the message, but I'm going to say it now. Many times we wish that we could just forget our past and move forward. I'm going to tell you, you, you should thank God that you can't forget your past. Your past mistakes and the, hard, the hardship that they brought you and the pain that they brought you and the troubles that they brought into your life, your memory of those is the only thing keeping you from doing it again. So those hardships in your past, be thankful that you can remember them and they're keeping you from doing them again and again. Amen? So we need to be thankful for that. So as an individual, we need to look back. First of all, we need to make sure we're saved. Second of all, we need to take an inventory of all that we've done for the cause of Christ, of all the good, of all the bad, of the heartaches, the troubles, the faults, and the failures that we've had. But as a church, we need to look back too and see the mistakes that we've made corporately. Too many people live in the past in a church. I hear many times people say, well, I remember when the church used to be this. I was going to say this later too. But I remember when the church used to do this, used to do that. I remember when sister so-and-so would get up and shout till her bobby pins went flying. I remember when brother so-and-so, he would get up and shout and stand and holler and jump in the pew. And he was so full of God. And I remember when we used to meet in a prayer room. And I remember when we used to have great revivals. And I remember this and I remember that. And that's all great. But I'm not near as concerned about what you used to know and what you used to do as what you're doing now and what we're going to do. Amen? I'm not going to live on a memory in the past when you and I should be creating new memories in the future. 
Your children need something to remember when they get our age. Your children need to remember uh, that I went to church and I remember that preacher standing up there spit hollering and snorting and yelling at us and I remember mom and dad getting excited and I remember the choir singing out, Brother Dean, and everyone singing out as loud as they could. I remember seeing hands go up. I remember hearing amens and I remember being drugged to church when I didn't want to go. We need to make sure we're creating memories for our children. I refuse to raise my kids on what the church used to be and grandkids. We need to be more concerned about the now and now. But our church, we've got goals in our church. Some of those are on that board. You see everybody's eyes turn at once. Some of them are, and that's fine. That's our prayer focus that we're praying about on Wednesdays. And we're going to continue to open the church doors on Wednesdays and pray about those things. But these are our goals. We've had goals in the past and we didn't meet those goals. And I'll take a lot of the blame for that. But we need to make sure we're going to meet these goals and do all we can to meet those goals as a church. So we need to look back. The second thing we need to do is learn. We need to remember we need to learn. We learn from our mistakes so we don't repeat them again. We learn individually. We learn as a church we try things. It may not work. Well, we look at it and we learn from it and we, and we adapt it. Now, most of you know me and you know me very well. I, I am not a preacher that is, uh, I don't know how to say this, who is fond of nor willing to bring in a lot of the new things that are out there into the church. I don't think they belong in the church. I don't think they're right for the church. I don't think they're pleasing to God to have in the church. I am old-fashioned. I was raised in an old-fashioned Baptist church where the Bible was the Word of God. It was the authority on everything, and I don't believe that's changed. However, I also realize we live in 2022. I realize that we have opportunities to share it this morning, right now. We're broadcasting live, live streaming. Uh, this sermon will go up on, on YouTube for anyone to watch at a later date. We have opportunities to use some of the new things for the glory of God. I'm not opposed to that. But I'm also not opposed just to doing anything in the world to bring every little thing into the church. Uh, there's a lot of gospel music that I don't like. I don't like it. If it sounds like rock music... It's not gospel music. Amen? God, we had the Kingsmen last night. They were great. And it's like I said then, gospel music speaks to your heart before it speaks to your feet. Right? So there's certain things that I'm not willing to do. However, I realize that we've got to change certain things. What worked 50 years ago, we've got to change that for our times. When they established the churches, and I've had people ask me, why is there a church on every street corner in these little, these little towns? I mean, you got a church here and, and just a couple miles down the road, you got another church a couple miles. And I said, you know why? All those churches are old. You had one in every community because people didn't get in their car and drive 30, 45 minutes. They got on a horse and a buggy, and they had to ride down to that church. This church was established in 1894. They, you think the parking lot looked like it does now? Cars sitting out there running a 70 mile an hour because you're late running to church and you're running 70 mile an hour and hoping and praying, God protect me before I get there and God don't let there be a cop around that next turn. Lord, I'm just trying to get to your house. Surely you wouldn't let me get a ticket. Get up earlier. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we need to learn from our mistakes and we need to be willing to make the changes that we need to do to move forward in today's time. I understand that. And I'm willing to do that as long as it, will, it, will, it does not hurt the integrity of the gospel in our church. I'm not willing to sacrifice that. Amen? Not willing to do so. The third thing, we need to leave, we need to repent, we need to let those things go. When you find those things, don't let the things in the past keep you from living in the present and moving forward in the future. You cannot let what happened 
20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago keep you from moving forward. If you've asked God to forgive you, repent and then let it go and move forward. Yes, preacher, but you don't understand and other people know and they don't forget. I don't care about other people. I don't answer to other people. Other people aren't in charge of my spirituality. Other people aren't in charge of my eternity. Other people don't have to give an account for what I do for the cause of Christ. I don't care what you've done. I'm not concerned about what you've done. Repent and move forward for the grace of God and for the glory of God, I should say. So we need to learn if it's in the past, leave it in the past. Don't drag it up. I came to this church over 19 years ago and I remember when I came and I remember this because of brother Freddie Leeser I remember when I came I said I don't care what happened in the church yesterday last week or last month I'm concerned about where we're at now and we're moving forward and brother Freddie came to me one day and he just said preacher I just want to thank you for helping us move forward and not keep bringing up the past the past has no bearing on where we're at right now let's move forward for the cause of Christ Let's move forward. How many here has never done anything wrong? Raise your hand. Mine's metaphorically raised. Never done a single thing wrong. Ain't nobody can point a finger at me. There ain't nobody can say I did this or that. No, you know why you point at that guy down the pew? It's because maybe he did something you consider is worse than what you did, and you're just getting the spotlight off of you. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all failed. We've all sinned. But we need to repent and move forward from those things. And the same thing as the church corporately. We must do so. I got to move on. I got to move on. We just can't keep beating ourselves up. Let's look at point two. Point two, the latter part of verse 13, verse 14. Let's read those. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So now we've looked at the past. We've saw our, our problems. We're repenting of those problems. We're going to move forward. We're going to move forward, church. Did anybody see a big white vehicle parked right in front of the church this morning? Did you notice on the side it said West Corinth Baptist Church? I thought it looked great. Amen. We just got the name on the side of the bus. We put it up front so everybody could see it. Now, you know what the next step is? Moving forward. Moving forward. That bus going to do no good sitting in that parking lot if we don't put that thing in drive and move forward. In fact, pretty soon we'll be having to, to weed around it. It'll be have flat tires. We've got to put it in drive. We've got to move forward. And that's what we need to do as a church. So let's look now. We're, we've come out of the past. Let's come to the present. So first of all, how... Uh, how we live. We need to take a look at how we live. Paul said here in uh, uh, verse number 14, he said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That word press means to move forward. It means to run after a thing in order to lay hold of it. To run after it in order to attain it. To lay hold of it. To make it yours. Paul did not consider his life just to be a, a hit or miss thing. Paul didn't consider his life just to be uh, in and out. Paul dedicated his life to the cause of Christ. That's what I'm asking from you this morning. Preacher, that's a lot to ask. Oh, no, no, no. That's not a lot to ask. Going to the cross and dying for your sins, that was a lot to ask. I thought I made this mention to somebody last week, and it's funny because I was going to keep this into myself for a whole year, like I'm going to keep it to myself for a whole year. A thought God gave me last week, and I made mention last night. I'm going to make mention of it now. We just left Christmas, uh, and we've moved forward into the new year. And the week after Christmas, God was just speaking to me. I was praying, and I was thinking about some things. And, and, I, and you see everywhere the reason for the season, and it shows the manger. He's the reason for the season. You know, I got to really thinking about that. And God spoke to me and said, no, Robert, you're the reason for the season. You're the reason that he had to come to this world and be born. His love for you, that was the reason he came to the world to be born of a virgin, to live and die at the hands of an angry mob. You're the reason. Christ didn't just come to the world because he didn't have anything better to do. 
He came to the world for you and I. We're the reason that he was born into this world. We're the reason that he suffered on a rugged cross and died at the hands of an angry mob. We're the reason that he rose again the third day victorious over death, hell, and the grave. We are. He loved us that much. Loved us that much. So Paul sold out. So it's not much to ask of you to do like Paul and to make Jesus your first priority to things that you do. There's simply two ways that we should be living. Number one, we should live for Jesus. Meaning that our thoughts and our activities and our our verbiage and our, our speak and all those things should glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We should live for Jesus. We should expend our life, and that's what we're doing every day. I don't know if you understand, even our young people, but every breath you take puts you one closer to your last breath. We are expelling and expending our life every moment. And it's not the length of our life, it's what we do in that time. And we need to dedicate our lives and live our lives for Jesus. But here's the issue. We not only need to live for Jesus, here's the thing, here's the key. We need to live by Jesus. What do I mean? I mean there's so many people that feel like failures because they're trying to live the Christian life, trying to do what's right, trying to to be the person they want to be, trying to be like Christ, and they're trying to do it in their own strength. You need to live for Jesus, but you have to do it in His strength. You have to do it by Jesus. You have to allow Christ to live His life through you. You can't do it, church. I can't do it. No one can do it. We can't make good sound decisions without Christ. We don't know how to move forward individually without Christ. We don't know how to move forward as a church without Christ. His power, His guidance, His leadership. we got to live for Christ, but we can only do it by Christ. So many people try to go about it in their own strength and, and, and their own way of doing things and therefore they fail, they get discouraged and pretty soon they're just quitting and they're out of church. We cannot afford to do that. So we need to watch how we live, but we also how we labor. Paul here was striving. Paul was reaching. He said, I press toward the mark. It means I'm reaching for that mark so I can obtain that mark. He was doing everything for the glory of God. He was pushing forward, laboring for Christ. Now listen, how many in here would consider your life busy? Raise your hand. Your life's busy. Isn't everybody's? We've all got a lot going on. And now, preacher, you're asking me to, 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 to give time to the cause of Christ. I don't have time. I'm going to give you a little word of advice. Don't kneel down and pray and say, God, I don't have time. Because he can find time. Amen? He can find you some time. Now we say, well, I don't have time to do all that. How many, ha- how many of us watch TV? Raise your hand. Look, I just found your time. Hey, how easy that was? I just found you some time. Turn off the TV, drop to your knees. Turn off the TV, invite a neighbor to church. Listen, I'm not condemning you. I'm as guilty as you are. My hand was in the air, not metaphorically that time, because I'm in the same boat. I'm just saying we make time to do the things that are important to us. We find the time to do the things that are important to us. We need to make sure Christ is of most important in our life, above everything. So how we labor? We're supposed to labor. We're supposed to labor now because night's coming. Church, this thing's winding down. I truly believe that. I truly believe that. Not only that, but how we love. How we love. Well, the Bible tells us, first of all, our love for God. Matthew 22, 36, 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Did that describe anyone in here? That you love God with every bit of your being? But also for our fellow men for the world, for the lost, for our, for our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible goes on to say there in the next two verses that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now you wouldn't intentionally do anything to harm yourself. Why would you your neighbor? You wouldn't intentionally say anything to discourage yourself. Why would you your neighbor? You wouldn't start a rumor about yourself. Why would you your neighbor? Love God with all our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbors as ourselves. So easy to say. So difficult to do. So difficult to do. So, when we take our spiritual inventory here, how would you describe yourself? 
How would you describe your life? Do you think you're right now, the, the life that you're doing, your dedication to Christ, your dedication to the work of Christ, your dedication to the house of God, would you think that God is pleased with your life right as it is or not? I'm not asking you to tell me. I'm asking you to take a, 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 an honest summary of your life. I, I'm doing the same with mine. Is God pleased with where we're at as a church or is He not? Are we doing as a church all we can do or are we not? I think we all know the answers to those. At least I hope we do. So we look at the past and we forget it, but we repent of it and we move into the present where we're supposed to be loving and living and working for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I want us to take a look at the prize in verse 14 again. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see here, we're partakers of a high calling. God saved you from sin when He gave you salvation. He brought you from death unto life. And you know what you did? Nothing to deserve it. All we did was accept the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took us from being aliens and strangers of this world to being a child of the King. Now you think about that. The next time, next time somebody tells you you're garbage, you're trash, you're worthless, hey, I'm a child of the King. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's building a mansion for me. I met a man yesterday, and uh, I won't go into the story, but I met a man, and he said, yeah, I used to work for an extremely wealthy man. I said, really? And I was just talking with him. Uh, I have no idea who he is, never talked to him. And uh, I, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I used to do all his electronic work around his home. He said he spent $20 million building his home. He said he had a marble, solid marble garage floor. Doesn't sound like he's too bright to me. Solid marble garage floor. Said he had 53 TVs in his home. And I had to set them all up. You ever heard the term more money than you got since? That's a perfect example, amen? Perfect example. But with all that said, Christ brought us from where we're at, poor, naked, hurting, and He brought us to be a child of the King. That house is nothing to the mansion my Father's building me. Amen? Now you just think about that for a moment. Yeah, but I want it now. Well, now we've been... Uh, you know, I'm 57 years old. I don't know how many more years I've got, days, hours. I don't know. We want something now. It's temporal. We ought to be laying up and building what's in eternity. Amen. That's forever. Amen? That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm concerned about. Let's, let's move forward. So we're partakers of a high calling. We're partakers of a holy calling. The Bible tells you and I that we are to be separate from the world. We are to be a separate people. We're not supposed to dress like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, go to the same places as the world, do the things the world does. We shouldn't watch the garbage on TV the world does. We shouldn't listen to the garbage the world listens to. We're different, church. We've been saved. We've been separated by the, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should act that way. Do you know when you go somewhere... You shouldn't have to stand up and proclaim you're a Christian. Your very actions should let them know that, that you're different. Amen? That you're different. You live your life different. You go different places. And I don't mean you're snobbish. Don't you dare be snobbish. I don't mean you act like you're better because you're not. You're just saved by the grace of God. But we should look at them with compassion and concern. But our actions should prove to them that we've been saved by the grace of God. So we're partakers of a holy calling. Holy calling. Not only that, but a heavenly calling. I'm going to close. A heavenly calling. You know, we've had several in this church, and the latest would be Brother Lewis, that have left this world and gone out to meet God. They're now in heaven by their testimony, by their actions, by what I believe. I could sit here and name many, many, many that I've buried in this church. And all they did was beat me to the prize. They just beat me out of here. They got ahead of me. They beat me getting to heaven. And they're happier now than they've ever, ever been. We don't know what true happiness is until we get there. 
I mean, listen, 2022 church is going to have troubles, going to have trials, going to have sickness, going to have heartache, going to have loss. But eternity is still going to be there. And my anchor holds. And we just hang on to Jesus and we're going to make it right on through. Amen? But while we're here, we've got a job to do. While we're here, we've got a job to do. So while we consider those things, I want to ask you a couple questions. Number one, are you saved? If you're not saved, I beg you, come to this altar. Let me take the Bible and tell you what it says about salvation. Oh, preacher, I couldn't dare come to that altar with people looking at me. No. You won't worry about what people are thinking if you truly want to get to Jesus. And the truth is, you know what people are going to think? Hallelujah. Another one got saved. That's what they're going to think. They're not going to think anything else because we're no different. So if you've never been saved, you need to do so. If you have been saved, are you living for Jesus? Are you living where you should be? Are, are, you, are you marred down by your past or are you living towards the future? Are we doing what we should do? Let's all stand just a moment. Hadn't planned on really having an altar call, but need to. All heads bowed and all eyes closed just for a moment. I just want you to be honest with yourself. Are you living like you should? Are you, are you where you want to be? If you're not, you can come to the altar. You can come to the front rows. You don't have to get on top of one another. You, you, can, you can come where you need to be. But are, are we, are, as a church, are we on track? Are we doing what we should be? Are we doing God's work? Are we doing God's will in our lives, in our church? Are we striving to be all that we could possibly be? I don't think there's one of us here that wouldn't come up wanting if we apply that to our lives. But with that said, I'm going to say this. We've got a good church, and we've done a lot of good things. And there are good things happening now. But I do believe things can be better. And if we do our part, they'll get better and they'll do better because God is coming back for His church. And until then, we need to be actively working for the cause of Christ. We need to not have to go out and try to hunt and find people to help in ministries. We should have a line of people saying, where can I help? What can I do to push the cause of Christ? Because the eternity of all those around us depends on it. Let's pray. Father, as we enter this new year, Lord, I pray that we would Remind ourselves of our past failures and mistakes. Repent of the things that we need to, Lord, but not let those things hinder us from moving forward. If we've repented, Lord, you've forgiven us and our slate has been wiped clean. Lord, we need to move forward for the cause of Christ. We need to stand and say, where can I work? Where can I serve? What can I do? And not dread someone coming and saying, can you help with this or that? May we expend this year for the cause of Christ. May we look for places to serve, things we can do, opportunities to share the gospel. Well, that's what would be pleasing to you. Father, I pray this year as we try to start new ministries here within our church, that you would guide us and direct us. May we do this all through you, Lord, through your leadership. We don't have the ability, we don't have the power. What we have here is the blessings of God and we need you to show us how to use those for your honor and your glory. Father, again, I thank you for everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.